Okay, good morning everyone. I'm here to uh, welcome uh, you all for Rune's PhD defense. Uh, it'll probably surprise you all, it's about solar cells. <laughs> More specifically on uh, the, the stability of solar cells. Uh, she uh, spent maybe the first three years of her PhD uh, looking at uh, the, the degradation and stability of organic uh, solar cells. And uh, then uh, you know, perovskites uh, really started taking off and uh, the efficiencies uh, were already up around 20% uh, three years ago. And um, I uh, had to have the difficult conversation. Um, would you be willing to consider uh, shifting your, your research to another class of, uh, of solar cells? And, uh, uh, she was willing to do that, and um, so she wrapped up some, some work on um, organic solar cells. And um, I don't think she, maybe she's going to show a slide or two of that uh, today. And, um, and then she really uh, dove in. And um, uh, I, 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 I didn't ask her to tell me how the solar cells degrade. I asked her to make them stable. Uh, there's a big difference uh, between the two. And um, she really uh, took on an aggressive campaign to uh, package the solar cells and work with the rest of the team to make the cell itself uh, very stable. And um, she's going to show you that she's passed uh, uh, most of the uh, tests that the industry uses to predict if um, uh, cells are going to last for 25 years uh, outside. And, um, uh, Three or four weeks ago, the Department of Energy, uh, was, uh, their whole solar program was being reviewed, and, and uh, they had 10 minutes to share the highlights of what's going on for the whole country in solar. And the uh, work you're about to see was you know, very heavily featured. Uh, the, the companies are um, quite interested. Uh, they, they know the stability is there. I mean, the, the efficiency is there. They don't worry about that, um, but the stability seriously, so, uh, so they, they, they follow this very closely. So let's uh, welcome Rune. Thank you, Mike, for your kind introduction. Today, I will bring you all to my very fun PhD ride, trying to make solar cell, or solution process solar cell more stable. First, let's look, look at this picture. The global energy consumption is really high, and if we use uh, fossil fuel alone, we use up in less than 100 years, and we're going to cause a lot of environmental problems. Therefore, we should try to get some energy from the sun, which is clean and renewable, and it can more than, it, uh, more than power the whole world. Um, and we should try uh, one way to have this uh, uh, solar energy in terms of electricity is using a solar cell. The current technology of the solar cells are, oh, I guess the, the, the technology that's outside in the market right now are these three types, silicon, silicon, and cattail, which has um, power conversion efficiency around 22 to 25%. However, they're done at a very high vacuum and high temperature. Therefore, we should try to figure out a way to lower the cost by doing solution process. Um, uh, the solution process also can be done at a lower, uh, lower temperature and lower cost, as, as I mentioned. And you can make it in a row-to-row -row process, which um, produce a very fast speed of solar cell. And this solar cell, this type of solar cell, also have comparably high efficiency to other commercial PV. As you can see, perovskite actually go higher than six and can't sell. So, but one problem that um, this solar cell has is stability. And for this type of solar cell to compete with other commercial technology, we need to um, improve the lifetime over 25 years so that we can get the cost lower and make the uh, and bring the solution process solar cell out in the market. 
Before we go on to figure out how solar cells break, I would like to walk you through how solar cells work. Um, when light gets absorbed in the active material, we generate an electron uh, hole pair, and then this electron hole pair gets split into opposite electrodes and get collected outside, and we produce an electricity. Um, the way that um, people measure power conversion efficiency is to take amount of power uh, amount of power coming out divided by amount of light coming in. Now, when we put the solar cell outside in the field, there's so many environmental factors that could cause the solar cell to degrade, and all these factors are as shown up here. When there's a U, that's the light shining on through your solar cell. There's a UV ray that, and also this light will heat up the solar panel, and to to almost high as 50 to 70 degrees Celsius. Moreover, there's a lot of in, in environment. There's a lot of oxygen and moisture that could creep into the solar panel and cause the cells to degrade. Also, if you're in a desert or there's a leaf falling on your cell, there could be some soiling problem that could put part of the cell in the reverse bias and heat up that part of cells and also degrade the cells. Lastly, um, the, the, when we go through day and night or um, as a solar panel lasts through winter and summer, there's a pretty high temperature fluctuation that would cause some mechanical issues. So, as Mike mentioned, the, at the beginning of my PhD, organic solar cell, which compose of fullerene and a mix, mix, mixing with either molecule or polymer in the active layer, was the highest uh, sol solution process solar cell at that time. And um, so I try to understand how they grade and try to see whether it can get the lifetime up to 25 years. The way to study lifetime is to look at, um, to break it down into different components. In this case, you can see the power conversion efficiency versus aging time. And the blue curve shows the storage stability, where we just keep the solar cell at 25C in inert atmosphere. The red curve, I just introduced a 70 degree heat in there. And the, the green is on top of the heat, I put the light and the maximum power uh, MPP. So how, we act, how do we actually look at the operational stability? We use a, an, an environmental chamber as shown in this picture. So here, this is an environmental chamber uh, with the constant flow of nitrogen. And here, you can see the solar cell in this uh, square connected out to electrical circuit to the multiplexer to keep the solar cell at maximum power um, to uh, kind of imitate what the solar cell will be in the field. And then we shine the light on with one sun intensity, which heats up the cell to about 50 to 70 degrees Celsius. So I, I look at the performance of six different uh, small molecule solar cells as shown here with the PC versus time of aging in this chamber. And we can see that there's a very rapid decay in the first 500 hours. And moreover, this, this will, like when, when we try to extract the lifetime from this linear region um, with the assumption of 5.5 uh, hours of sunlight per day, we got the lifetime a little bit less than three years. So, um, at that time, clearly, we are really far away from 25 years, and um, perovskite came in, and it looks it has a higher efficiency than OPD. So, you know, by the time I, I, I was in my PhD, perovskite was already 20%. So I tried to bring my knowledge in um, stability of organic solar cell and try to uh, improve the lifetime of perovskite solar cell. So the perovskite solar cell has a name from this crystal structure, ABX3, with, um, with a combination of inorganic and organic ion, uh, cations. But most importantly, 
these are the two things, uh, the organic cations and the, and the halide are the most reactive things that would lead to degradation that I will, I will touch on later. So as I had mentioned in a previous slide, these are the different parameters that could cause the solar cell to degrade. And these four parameters are the things that I will focus on in my talk, which is a temperature cycling, a UV um, exposure, and uh, degradation that's due to heat and moisture. And, and in all these cases, it will, um, the perovskite, this is an example of perovskite, it's most commonly used, the methyl ammonium lead iodide. So with any with, with, with heat, moisture, and UV, it will decompose the perovskite into a methyl ammonium iodide, and it will vaporize, and you leave behind a lead iodide. If you go into a lab, a perovskite solar cell lab, um, you can see the perovskite films here, which is it would be originally brown, and when it degrades, you see a clear um, discoloration into yellow lead iodide, as you see later on. Our group have developed a stack of perovskite solar cell here, which compose of 500, 500 nanometers of perovskite active layer, surrounded by nickel oxide hole transport layer and um, PCB and lithium fluoride and tin oxide uh, electron transport layer. We we use an IT, uh, we use ITO as transparent electrodes on both sides of the solar cell, and all this sit sit on top of glass. This solar cell has 14% power conversion efficiency in a single junction, and then um, it when when Kevin put this on top of the on top of silicon. He, he got the efficiency all the way up to 23.6%. Uh, when we designed the solar cell stack, we, um, we had two things in mind for stability. First is that we have a mixture of cesium and palladium, which, supposed, uh, which was shown to have a higher thermal stability than typical metamonium lead iodide. We also put this sputter layer, uh, sputter ITO layer on top for two reasons. First is to prevent the volatile organic from leaving, and second is to um, prevent mo the moisture from getting in. So from, from w when we have this structure, let's see how the solar cell will degrade, or whether they will last. So with this stack, I, I take my whole stack here, this is initial stack. Um, we can see that this, the, this stack alone degrades in temperature cycling when I cycle it through negative 40 degrees Celsius and 85, as you can see from um, originally brown with some purple tint because of the uh, ITO on top. Just this color, uh, it just turned from this color to yellow, which is lead iodide. When I put this stack in the dead heat test at 85 degrees Celsius and 85% humidity, it took me only 300 hours to um, degrade this whole perovskite. So clearly um, this stack alone is not enough to last outside in the field and we need to develop some encapsulation to make it more robust in the environmental field. So, um, let's review what other people have studied and tried to uh, package this perovskite and make it more stable. First group of people, they use a hydrophobic lymphoma. <coughs> so this way you deposit a layer on top, either some polymer, polymer layer or some oxide layers, simply as that. And, um, this is to prevent the moisture from getting into perovskite. But as I shown in a previous slide, um, this stack, in, the, in our case we use ITO, was not enough to um, help the perovskite last, especially we saw a degradation in the temperature cycling, which is this stack alone. So we need something better. Another group of people use a UV epoxy edge seal. So, this is the bottom, so this is perovskite substrate and UV epoxy is everywhere as a light blue and you top that with um, glass 
and cure, shine UV on for a few seconds. And this step is really simple because it can be done at 25 degrees Celsius and the, the top glass will help prevent anything from getting into perovskite. But um, the, the epoxy are known to be very brittle. So if you go through temperature cycling, this epoxy can debind and the moisture can get in and this probably would last the damp heat test. Another group of people, Martin Green, used a, a polyisobutylene, as shown here. So this is perovskite structure, and he just put polyisobutylene all on top of perovskite, topped that with copper, topped that with glass, and um, he, he picked this because he know that PIB is very efficient in delaying moisture. But um, from his study. He, with, with this structure, he can pass the two-net temperature cycling, but he only lasted less than 600 hours in that heat. So this, this technique doesn't seem to be sufficient either. So as you can see, in all these three cases that people have used to package perovskite, um, any of them alone are not sufficient. So um, I picked the best of both worlds, or I guess, I picked this ITO as my top layer, and I picked PID as my STO, and designed my own packaging using a glass glass technique, which has shown to last uh, to enable silicon solar cell to last 25 years in the field. So the glass glass encapsulation have um, so we put the perovskite solar cell PSC in the middle, and we have the conductive ribbon coming. Off out on both sides to so, so that we can measure the performance of the solar cell later on. And um, this glass is surrounded by a capsule and the edge seal on the edge and have a solar glass on both sides. And once we have this package, it looks like this. But um, there are, we, we have to carefully select two things to make this um, to, to, the, to make this package work. First is the edge seal, we have to make the right edge seal, and the second is encapsulant. In my study, I use a beauty rubber edge seal. I use a beauty rubber as my edge seal because as um, Martin Green and Mike Kempe have shown, it's the best material in delayed moisture and it has two order of magnitude lower in water vapor distribution rate compared to uh, other poly polymeric encapsulant. Also, this edge seal has a very low glass transition temperature, which make it very compliant when we go through the temperature cycling. Unlike the new epoxy that the other group have used. When we select the encapsulant, I just first look at the three different things that out in the solar industry, ethylene binding acetate EVA, sterling ionomer, and polyolefin. The first function of the encapsulant should be to um, physically protect the solar cell from any uh, shear or scratch between the cells and the glass. And the second property is it needs to have a relatively low elastic modulus, so it can last through the it can it can last through the temperature cycling, which I will show later on. Third, it should have a, also a low moisture ingress in case the water gets in from the edge seal. We, we, we want to delay the water as long as possible so that it doesn't degrade our cell. Fourth, it should have a really good electrical insulation, meaning that we don't want any um, any leakage current getting out into the encapsulant, and most of it should be in the solar cell. And in this case, we can see the polyolefin has the highest volume resistivity, meaning that it should not have this um, leakage problem. Um, fifth thing is that the encapsulant needs to um, be chemically inert, and it should not degrade the active materials. And lastly, we want to make sure that the encapsulant will allow most of the light to get into the solar cell so we can get the most of the most current and the power out of the solar cell. 
So once we have those two components selected, how do we actually package it though? We, we, we use a vacuum laminator, as shown in this picture. In the first step, we, so at, we, we, we like stack everything together. We first pull the vacuum pretty high and let the substrate heat up from room temperature up to uh, the set point, either 140 or 150, depending on the type of castling that you use. Then we press the substrate at another high temperature to, this, this is to cure the encapsulant and um, make it stick, adheres better to the top glass and bottom and pretty much keep everything together for um, this period of time, also depending on the type of video encapsulant. There are two things that you need to take into consideration when um, trying to package these cells. First, during the vacuum process, you need to make sure that you minimize the movement of the solar cell because during the heating process, the encapsulant will be in a molten state and it, can, it will flow and move the substrate around, which would create some cavities and have moisture in, which can then later degrade the cell. So we want to try to either fix the substrate somehow and, yeah, minimize it. Second, during the pressing step, we want to make sure that we apply the pressure really evenly so that the, the final thickness are, even, like, are the same everywhere so that I don't have this crack. This is five hours after my, I finish lamination. So there's no built-in pressure that would create a crack later on. So these are the two things. We're going to go and try to laminate ourselves. <laughs> Now, once we have our package, let's, um, let's see how the package will last through these different parameters. I will first explore the temperature cycling portion. There are two concerns regarding mechanical stability for the perovskite solar cell to not be able to withstand the temperature fluctuation. First is when you look at the perovskite solar cell stack, there's so many layers, first of all, and um, looking at the linear thermal expansion coefficient in the parentheses, there are a lot of mismatches. For example, look at perovskite and the substrate. This is quite big. Or if you look at the uh, silver and the ITO, with any of these, as you heat up the whole stack, um, either during aging or putting in field, um, different layer would expand differently. And with that, like some, with the, the two layers that have a very different in expansion would peel apart and cause some delamination. So this caused a lot of concern. Another thing is that perovskite has the lowest fracture energy measured by the Oscar group of all other solar technology, meaning that it takes the least amount of force to pull them apart and this is very concerning. So I first looked at the fracture energy of our perovskite solar cell stack and, um, use, uh, and using the double cantilever beam to measure this fracture energy. So just imagine you put the film that, inter that of interest in between a very too thick piece of glass and pull it apart with the constant displacement rate, and then measure amount of force that it takes to pull them apart and fit the fracture energy through a stress ring curve. In this graph, I show a fracture energy of four different devices. So ITO device means it's, out, it's just my original perovskite stack. These three things represent the condition for lamination. This one in particular is the same perovskite device that go through a lamination process at 140 for 20 minutes. And this is with the when I laminate, when I put the encapsulant on top of my current perovskite so it's that top of the glass. In all cases, you can see that the fracture, uh, the PCBM is the weakest layer, which the fracture went through, and um, this 
Fracture energy of our original perovskite device is only 0.2 joule per meter squared. The way to imagine that is that when I when I went to lab, I can just take my perovskite, put the scotch tape on, and I can it's just me. I can just peel it apart very easily, and that's about 0.2 joule. So it's very concerning. When I try to investigate how um, perovskite cell cell stack would change when we put the laminate, uh, when we laminate it with encapsulants, I I, com I use these three things to compare. First, I'm, I was curious whether um, processing step 140 for 20 minutes would change any fracture energy or would make the perovskite um, easier or harder to fracture, but it seems like it doesn't do anything. But when I actually have a physical layer of capsulin on top, both, uh, both EVA and serlin, um, we can see the fracture energy increased by four order of magnitudes. So um, seems like having a layer of capsulin just um, makes it harder as it absorbs the strain for the crack, as the crack tries to propagate through, this layer just want to close the crack, so we just need more force to pull this layer apart. So um, this, this slide shows you that having an encapsulant in our glass glass configuration could make peroxide one step more mechanically robust, but we don't really know how the solar cell would do in the temperature, um, in the actual temperature fluctuation. So I went on and, uh, and, and do a temperature cycling test with my solar cell stack following the IEC standard, which when they um, cycle the solar cell between negative 40 degrees Celsius and hold it for 10 minutes and bring it up to 85 and hold it for another 10 minutes and cycle that for two minute cycles. Um, in order for a solar package to pass, we need to make sure that there's no delamination and um, the performance drops less than 10 percent. First, I picked Serlin as my encapsulant because it has the lowest water vapor transmission rate. So I thought that we would. So I think yes, this might be good for a solar panel, a, a solar package. But when I after two minute temperature cycles, you can see a clear delamination as rainbow fringes, as I boxed in this photo. When I later investigate this area using a laser beam induced current, um, as so I, I shine the light on and kind of move, or, move the light along my pixel and measure the current that's coming out from that area, I can see that the area with rainbow fringes or that delaminated, I didn't see any current, while the area that looks intact or brown perovskite have a lot of current. So I, I hope that I've shown you that Serlin, using Serlin caused a delamination problem in the package. When I look at a solar cell, actually five different solar cells in three different packages of Serlin, I saw that at least four out of five has more than 10% degradation. So we, we fail the tuner temperature cycling test with this uh, with this serlin encapsulant. Why is that? I went back and looked at my encapsulant um, table and I found that the elastic model is really high, almost 400 megapascal. And um, this could explain, and, and, and knowing and talking to the Oscar group, we know that the serlin adhered really well to um, ITO and glass. So, what happened during the uh, temperature cycling is likely um, the serlin just pulls apart the PCPM layer, exposing all the moisture um, getting in and degrade the perovskite. And that's why we see a we see a drop in performance as shown in this graph. So it seems like we need a better, um, perhaps lower elastic modulus um, encapsulant to make it more flexible during the temperature cycling. So I, I, I went ahead and used an EVA, which has 
only 10 megapascal compared to the 400. So it should, should be more flexible. And I was right. Um, if you look at the photo of the solar cell package in EVA, we didn't see any delamination at all after two conversion cycles. And all solar cells, in this case, there's like all nine solar cells in um, three different packages, remain pretty much flat. So we pass the virtual cycling test. So in this study, we learned that in selecting a suitable encapsulant, we need something that's um, flexible, meaning something that has a low plastic bonus to withstand the temperature cycle. Now, let's look at the second factor. What happened when we shine a UV light on the perovskite? So, this is the stack of perov uh, this is the common stack of perovskite solar cell with the titania, a TiO2. People usually use it as a mesophorous uh, nanosphere or use it as a compact ITO. Um, when when Thomas shined a UV light onto this solar cell stack, he found that in either both encapsulated and non-encapsulated, it um, it dropped uh, it caused the solar cell to degrade in four hours, which is not good. But when he put the UV filter on top of the this stack or UV filter to filter the UV, he he saw that we see a very, very a minimal drop in UV in, in, in the performance of the solar cell. So this is one step promising to um, try to use, you know, but you, using UV filter is not desirable. So actually he, he suggests to go for something that doesn't have titania. And another colleague of his used a titania, uh, Replace the titanium, which is in red here. So this is the max. This is like a power conversion efficiency versus time of titanium <coughs> solar cell, which degrade a lot. But when you replace that with C60, you see much, much less, much less degradation. So they prove, or I guess they shown, or suggest that we should try to remove the titanium from the stack, and that might help perovskite be stable in UV. So, looking at my stack, I, I took my stack, packaged it in the typical glass glass encapsulant, in the encapsulation, and I shined a UV light with a 359 meter light on. And by doing this, I'll heat up my package to around 55 degrees Celsius, and, in, and this, uh, this test is done in ambient. I, one design change I do is that I remove the encapsulant between the perovskite and the solar glass to try to get the maximum of UV onto my perovskite solar cell. I was curious how, how much UV actually get onto my cell. So I measure transmission of the light through that two glass, the, sol the thick solar glass and the perovskite <clears throat> substrate, perovskite substrate. And I saw that Glass did quite a good job in filtering out the UVB, but we still have a lot of UVA in this area, which could degrade the perovskite. But when I put this package under an app following another IEC standard, which required 15 kilowatt hours per, uh, per meter square, we sh we see that all three solar cells passed this test, and we didn't see any change in the color. So agreeing with Thomas and the community that removing titanium and using something that's more robust to UV can make perovskite stable under the UV exposure. Now let's look at the last factor that the last and the most challenging factors for the perovskite community, the effects. Uh, the, the effect from heat and moisture, which I make even more challenging by combining them together using a dead heat test. So I believe that my package would pass or would survive in a uh, dead heat test. So I um, so this is a graph of two 
encapsulated solar cells in the dam heat, 85 3C and 85% humidity. We can see that the two of the solar cells um, have an increase in performance after a thousand hours. So this is very promising. And um, this is mostly due to the increase in voltage and a slight drop in, um, in the current. However, when we look at a solar cell under the solar simulator, we see a very clear degradation. Um, as there's like three things going on in this picture. First, is you can see a metal induced degradation around the solar uh, around the solar rib, uh, uh, conductive ribbon and the perovskite. Which, if the degradation starts here, it can go on and cause the other area to degrade. Second, it's a moisture-induced degradation where um, we, we, we think that the, the moisture gets in through the, to the solar ribbon and it causes this area under the protected ITO to degrade. And the third thing is that you see some reaction between the encapsulant EVA and the perovskite under it. So um, in the next two slides, I will show you and I will confirm you whether this hypothesis that I have are true. First, let's look at the metal induced degradation. So in this case, I, I took a perovskite solar cell as shown in this picture, and I, I aged them in for a thousand hours at 85 degrees Celsius in nitrogen, and we see a clear metal reaction between like. So this is a silver electrode, so I see the reaction between silver and perovskite around here and up there. And when I try to figure out whether this effect is true for, for all metal, like whether this is just true for all across the metal or just silver, I, I did an experiment where I didn't have metal, compared to solar cell without metal, and solar cell with silver, copper, and gold as electrodes on here separately. We see that the one with uh, metal has a very severe drop in current, has a drop in current, and which also caused a drop in um, performance, while the one with metal did not have any drop. So um, the way to try to fix this problem is there's two ways. First, I could try to avoid the vertical um, perovskite metal overlapping, meaning that I just have to use um, spaces apart somehow. Or I can use a metal uh, diffusion barrier to, um, <coughs> to prevent this metal diffusion and react with perovskite. I will, I, will, I will stick with the first um, method that I proposed. I mean, try to fix this problem through my solar cell packaging design. The other two things that could cause um, perovskite cells to degrade are water and the reaction between the encapsulant and the perovskite. So first, as you can show in, as you can see in this picture, this is perovskite cell so with water droplets. It, we can see that it, this color only after two minutes and it completely degraded after 18 minutes. So clearly if you have any uh, moisture or water diffusing into our package, we will see degradation. Third thing is that we know, according to Mike Kennedy, that the EVA could, uh, release acetic acid when we heat it up or when, we, when the moisture gets to it or when we shine the UV light on, which um, it was unclear. Uh, whether this acidic acid would degrade the perovskite, but my hypothesis is it will. So I, I put acidic acid on top of my perovskite solar cell, and I saw a discoloration as well. In this case, this is at room temperature for 80 minutes, and just as we heat it up, it, 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 it reacts faster. So with these two problems, we should try to fix it by um, minimizing moisture and rest, and perhaps, or not perhaps, we should select a new encapsulant to uh, the, the non-reactive one so that we don't have this problem. So I propose a second generation package design. 
um, as shown here. To fix three problems, as, as, as I mentioned in the previous slides. First, I tried to fix the metal induced degradation problem by using a top ITO electrode here. In this case, as you can see, there's no vertical overlap between the metal and the perovskite. So, if we assume that, yeah, so so that this metal cannot get in, get to the perovskite, and we shouldn't have the metal induced degradation problem. Second, we um, try to minimize the moisture, uh, moisture or water induced degradation by because we because as I mentioned earlier. I, I, I think that the moisture getting through the ribbon, so I try to get rid of the ribbon, and this moisture also getting through like a trap cavities as the soils are moved during lamination. So to get rid of that problem, I design a solar, solar cell on, like I just fabricate the solar cell on one side of the glass for packaging, and use a on substrate electro feed through instead of solar ribbon. So we should have minimum moisture getting in. Third, we need to select the perovskite with a um, with a more suitable encapsulant so that it doesn't react like EVA. So how do we actually select the encapsulant? I use a pressure cooker, um, which a lot of solar companies use. The, the condition of 100 percent. Uh, relative humidity and uh, 120 degrees Celsius, which is to speed up everything that would cause the solar cell to degrade. And I compare the solar cell encapsulate in three different encapsulants. We can see a clear degradation due to acidic acid in EVA. Um, in sterling, we did not see any reaction with, uh, between perovskite and the encapsulant. But we do see some delamination here, as I have mentioned earlier, from the temperature cycling, so probably some, because sterling is really stiff. Well, for polyolefin, I did not see any delamination, and I did not see any um, reactions between the encapsulant and the perovskite. So it seems to be the best um, of these three families. So I further study how, how low or like which polyolefin <coughs> use, so I compared two of them with um, two numbers of elastic modulus. I found that the one with the higher elastic modulus delaminate, just like so, so it's still too stiff. So we need something like seven megapascal here, so that it keep, so this is the active area, protected active area, so it keep all the active area intact. So I picked this for my further um, damping test. And as expected, um, when I put my solar cell, packaged solar cell with the right encapsulant and right design, I pass, I guess, uh, look at the performance over a thousand hours, they all flat and have less than 10% drop in performance in a thousand hours, and they didn't have any change in color in both cases. As I say, so we passed that new test, um, which uh, takes all, uh, makes that really really in the prospect community. And comparing a um, how the solar cell do in a dry heat with 25% uh, relative humidity versus the one in damp heat, we see very similar degradation. So I would say <coughs> that the package is holding off the moisture really well. So I hope that um, I have demonstrated and convinced you that perovskite can, if we properly package perovskite, it can be stable through a temperature cycling test, meaning it can be mechanically robust. It can withstand the UV exposure, and it can finally, actually this is for the first time in the field, pass the dead heat test that everyone is concerned about. And with this promising stability result, we can then take the solution process solar cell perovskite, which has a very high performance, to um, to have a uh, like a comparable number of costs as other type of solar technology, and then it can be out in the industry. I would like to. Thanks all my committee who came today. I know it's early. Um, thank, first, would like to thank.
thank Mike for all the opportunities that you have given me and all things that you have taught me. I think I've grown and learned so much. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Alberto, um, Reiner, and Stacy, for sharing your lab with me. Me and and your like letting me work with your student. It's been really fun learning from all of them and getting to talk to you all at some time. And thank you, Janan, for being here as my chair. Actually, I I had a I had a lot of I got a lot of inspiration from you when I go to a lot of the women in science events. So. Thank you for inspiring for the whole PhD. And I would like to thank all my um, all my collaborators, especially the one at Stanford, Nick and um, Jimmy, or Axel is not here, and a lot of people in the OPD time from UCSB, Georgia Tech, NC State, Nankai, and HKUSD from you know like they they all hosting they, they host me really well and we have a very nice collaboration and people at NREL who helped me um, put the puzzle together try to fix the encapsulation problem and especially people at D2 Solar who actually taught me how to package a solar cell also um, we we figure out a lot of uh, we try to modify a lot of rounds of packaging together and also learn how to drive then. So it was a lot of fun driving 40 minutes down there. <laughs> um, thank you, Laurie from Quantix, who provide Etsio and have a lot of insightful conversation and try to um, let us pass the damn test and people at Sunbeam to let us do the ITO sputtering and all these encapsulant companies to give me free samples. <laughs> Um, and I would like to thank all the wonderful staff who has had a lot of colors to my PhD and I can just walk into the office and just say hi and have a nice conversation and have a lot of nice events together, so thank you. And to the McGee group, from the time when I joined the group to, we still, we always been a very fun and dynamic 